It's good to see everybody this morning. It's a privilege to get to speak to you today. And it's so good to have Tony and Misha back. And we're glad they had a little time to rest this past week. Thank you all for the support for the Rwanda team. I just can't express to you how grateful we all are Uh, This year, this church has just boosted their giving, their faith, their love to send us and uh, go without concerns. Um, The eight of us that are going from this church, uh, it's going to be a wonderful experience. Uh, Lane and I have been before with Tony and Misha. Tony's, of course, been the pioneer and the leader there, and it's an honor to get to, to go and to to uh, serve there. Of course, Tony won't get to go because he's got some planned medical care coming up this month, but we're going to go and do our best and um, try to pretend to be Tony and Misha. No, no. We're going to be ourselves. We're going to be ourselves. You know, it takes all kinds, doesn't it? Yeah, when y'all see me up here, y'all know, boy, it takes all kinds, doesn't it? Um, I appreciate uh, you being here today. And this opportunity and privilege. I appreciate Andrea's word that she shared. There was more to it than what we could actually get at the appointed time. But there is more to that word that is uh, unfolding in the whole body of Christ. The older generation of leaders are having to learn how to equip and make room for the younger generation that's coming up. We can't all monopolize the, uh, the ministry opportunities or the, the openings that God has created. I'm not a career vocational politician trying to pad my pocket so I can stay here for life like some people in Washington, D.C. I would love to work myself out of a job. I want to see the replacement step up. And love the Lord, love His Word, love God's people, and move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, so that I can just sit back and and uh, like and me and Tony can sit back and just say wise things occasionally, and let it let everybody else do the work. And that's what we're about. We're trying to equip people to do the work of the Lord, and that's a huge transition. How many of you know that's not an easy transition? And uh, I just want to say from my heart, I am proud of this church. Um, I know everybody here comes from different backgrounds. I was raised a Pentecostal. Then I was lowered into the charismatic renewal. And then God dragged me back into the traditional church and showed me he loves everybody everywhere that's trying to follow him any way they can. He's determined not to leave anybody out. And many people, and some of them watching on television, feel like they're boxed in. They're stuck where their family goes, where their traditions are, but they're hungry for more. And they're afraid to take the next step because they don't know what to do. I want to help you this morning know what to do. Because we are in a wonderful season of transition, and you're going to find out many of your instincts were right. God's up to something, and he's including you. And there's some things he's doing, and there's other things he's watching for you to do. Now, that's an interesting dilemma. What's my part and what's God's part? And you'll always walk in that balance in your Christian life. If you have your Bibles, please turn to uh, John chapter 7. John chapter 7. We went through this section at the men's meeting a few months ago through the book of John. And right now, the men's group on Monday nights is going through the book of James. It is so much fun. It's so educational uh, just to hear the Lord using the different brothers as we go around the table, share what we're learning, and we learn from one another. It is so rich. 
But here in the book of John, there's a passage that has always meant a lot to me. You've probably heard me use this passage before when I've taught about the gift of the Holy Spirit and how that gift operates in our lives to help us in prayer and praise and prophecy and worship. But here are the words of Jesus. And we're going to dig into this a little bit, and there's more to it than what you ever knew. I bet you. So let's get into it. Why don't we stop and just ask God to be our teacher right now for a moment, would you? Bow your head and say, Dear Lord Jesus, please open my understanding of the Scriptures. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay. Now, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version from John chapter 7, verse 37. And here... He's been having some interesting conflict and dialogue and discussion with the Jews who begin to turn against him about this section of the ministry career of Jesus. But he stood, in fact, let me give you a little more context. Back in verse 1, Jesus was walking in Galilee and he was unwilling to walk in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Uh, What would you do if your pastor that you were working with and enjoying, if there was a plot out on his life? The controversy got so strong as he he preached the kingdom of God and, and made disciples and cast out devils and called people to repent and turn to God and quit trusting in religious traditions. And certain leaders in the organized church got so mad at the revivalist that they plotted to kill him. Can murder be in the heart of religious people? Yeah, yeah. I tell you what, people can get so angry they open the door to the devil. They can get demonized with a spirit of hatred and murder. And I want to tell you, there's nothing more wicked, mean, or malicious than a religious demon that hates you. Jesus chose his enemies well. He wanted to be on the side of God and of the Holy Spirit, not on the side of religious demons that tried to control people and keep them pressed down and passive. It's okay. We know you can't get delivered from that sin, so we know it's a weird thing that's afflicting you and affecting your life, but we're just going to compromise our doctrine to make peace with it so you can keep coming to our comfortable little church. And when they make disciples, they make them twofold more the child of hell. Instead, we preach the gospel and get people saved and delivered and healed and made whole so they can walk with Jesus with a glad, free heart. Amen? Amen. That's the gospel. It sets people free. It doesn't keep them tame and passive sitting on a pew. We are becoming an army for Christ, as that word that Andre had shared. Where Israel came out of Egypt, a mob coming out of slavery. God gave them the Ten Commandments. He showed up in their presence. He parted the, the Red Sea and delivered them from the army of Pharaoh. He gave them the Ten Commandments, started forming a nation and a civilization out of them, fed them manna in the wilderness, worked miracles of deliverance, water out of the rock, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, their stubbornness. Oh, they were stubborn. You ever been stubborn? You ever been insisted on digging in your heels? Been there, done that, got a degree in it. (laughs) You know what God does when you dig in your heels? He waits. He doesn't stop. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't relent. He just waits until you repent. And you know what? God can outlast you. (laughs) He's proved that to me. So Israel was coming out of Egypt, no longer slaves, no longer a mob. They became a nation 
getting ready to inherit their promised land. So anyway, Jesus had some enemies. He was making disciples, preaching the kingdom, and he was moving amongst these religious people whose system was being threatened by his renewal movement. Do you see that? I mean, it wasn't all roses with the religious people about Jesus. Beware when all men speak well of you. <laughs> now, I think we ought to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, and we don't need to make waves unnecessarily. Pick your battles. But recognize there are enemies that will try to trip you up, and your safety is in the presence of God and radical obedience to the word of God. He will, keep, he will give his angels charge over you if you keep obedient to God. Here, Jesus had a sense of timing. He stayed in Galilee. The Jews were fomenting conspiracies against him. They got the religious leaders to hatch a plot to assassinate him. And his brother said, hey, go, go show yourself in Judea. <laughs> I wonder if his brothers yet knew who he really was. <laughs> Uh, but his brother said to him, verse seven, chapter 7, verse 3, uh, Go show, let them see your works. <laughs> and Jesus said, verse 6, My time is not yet, but your time is always opportune. And you, he said, verse 8, You go to the feast. Now, the setting is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is a huge event for Israel. Now, let me give you the context again, historical context. In Israel, as they came out of Egypt, this was thousands of years ago, before the nation of Israel ever existed, before the time of Christ, they came out of Egypt, the children of Abraham, and they crossed the wilderness. God gathered them together and gave Moses the Ten Commandments. It's interesting. Thunder and fire and the shaking of the mountain, and the people were fearful, and God came down to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up to meet him. When do you think next that God is going to come down and his people are going to go up? There's a similarity there, isn't there? And it's going to happen with thunder. I think it's going to shake the earth. I believe Jesus Christ is coming back. And it is an exciting time to be alive because the harvest fields of the earth are ripe. What God's been waiting on is for the body of Christ to grow up. We've been babies. We've been mere men. We've been each isolated, independent, egotistical, ambitious, not walking in submission to Christ or in love with one another. And the Lord has had enough of it. He's calling us to come together. He's baptizing us into the sea and into the cloud. And we're following Moses. And he's got a promised land for us, an inheritance for us. There's a destination for us. Right now, our pilgrimage, our walk with God is a journey. It is not a destination. Just because you've been born again or baptized in water, that doesn't mean you've arrived. You've started your journey. Following the Lord Jesus Christ is a walk with him. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. It is a never-ending re-enrollment in the school of the Spirit. Because every day, God wants an appointment with you to teach you and show you something new you didn't know before. Have, did, you miss, did you miss your appointment with God this morning? I remember I was in a church, where was this? Somewhere up in Iowa or Idaho, I forget those two states, always mixed up. And I was at a a guy that had an apostolic grace on his life to plant new churches, and he was up there planting a new one, and he had me come up and share and minister. And I remember in that place pointing to a man on the front row, 
at the end of my ministry time, sometimes the anointing comes on me to prophesy to people. And I said to him, the Lord has an appointment with you and you need to show up because there's an anointing and a calling laying around your feet that you need to pick up. And um, I went on, didn't think anything about it, didn't know much about it. The, I, uh, John told me later, the, the, the pastor there, he said, did you know he'd been, he'd been once called into the ministry? I said, no, I didn't know. I never, never met him. Went back a year later. He had me back for another camp meeting or something. And uh, at the end of the meeting, I was just discerning what is God doing or saying here with these people, anything special you want to do, Lord? And if, if God's not doing anything, I don't want to try anything. <laughs> but if he's doing something, I want to be obedient. And I turned to a man on the front row and I prophesied a word to him. God has an appointment with you. He wants you to be in your prayer closet seeking him because he's got some things in you that you've laid down. He wants you to pick up again. I'd forgotten who he was, but the pastor told me over lunch, you just prophesied the same thing to the same man a year apart. God doesn't forget. He knows where you are, and he wants an appointment with you every day. Your time with the Lord is more important than your time watching television. You can't ever get away from the secret place. Anyway, Jesus is here at this festival, and here, the Feast of Tabernacles, a big seven-day celebration. They have to sleep out in booths outside of their, their structured home. All of Israel, it impacted the whole nation, and it's one of the seven feasts. In fact, it's the last one of the year. Do y'all know, isn't today Yom Kippur? Now, what is that? Anybody know? What? Day of Atonement. And that's the day when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies only once per year and makes an atonement for the sins of the nation. Now, individuals could come and bring free will offerings, sacrifices, and get cleansed of their sins. That was individual. But once a year, the high priest goes in on behalf of the whole nation. And, that, and if he didn't do it properly, he would die. It was a very holy event, happened once a year. And Jesus Christ is our high priest who has taken his own blood into the holy of holies in heaven and made an eternal sacrifice that never again needs to be repeated for the new holy nation, the church. Wow, I get goosebumps saying that. Amen. Doesn't that make you excited to know he has paid the price for you to be forgiven of your sins? How much more does it behoove us to humble ourselves, respond to him, and be obedient to his word? Amen? There's some things God does for you, some things you have to do for yourself. And hearing his word and obeying him is one of those things you have to do for yourself. God doesn't want passive followers. He wants active participants. That's why he says to the men, lift up your hands and pray without wrath, without doubting, without dissension. Men, you have a role to play as militant intercessors, as prophetic priests, as, a, as the, the head of your family to guard your family with prayers that keep watch and invoke the presence of God and repel evil. The devil shows up at your door wanting your kids. What are you going to do? You're going to say, no, sir, not in my house you won't. As for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. So anyway, all of that was free of charge, not in my notes. On the last day of the Feast of, of Tabernacles, which is uh, coming up in just a, a week or so, that's a seven-day celebration, and the last day of it is a great feast. Now, on the Feast of Tabernacles, what had the priests been doing every day while all this huge crowd had gathered? I mean, there were three, three of these seven feasts that the Lord said, this, this was a holy convocation. It was a pilgrimage you had to make. And even if it was just the men of the family, everybody had to gather these three times a year. And it was a Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And when, when the last day of that feast was over, Jesus stood up and made a proclamation. 
Now, what was going on around him for him to make this proclamation? Let me read the proclamation. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. From his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit. Everybody say that with me. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, what did he mean by the Spirit was not yet given? When was the Spirit given? Pentecost. By the way, Pentecost comes 50 days after Passover. All of this is in the Jewish calendar. The Passover, the unleavened bread, the Pentecost. And those, those, those festivals and feasts were fulfilled in the first advent of Christ. All of them were fulfilled as types. See, God wrote history and previewed history for Israel with those feasts. Israel, you don't, we don't know what it would have been like to have been raised in that culture. We live in a libertarian society where just about anything goes, which is sad. Because social disorder is disintegrating. But in Israel in that day, their whole life revolved around these seven annual feasts. Certain things you had to do. Their whole life revolved around the Sabbath. Every Saturday evening, the Sabbath meal. Their family gathered and had a ritual they did I mean, nowadays to have a family gather for any meal during the week is amazing. My wife and I, when our kids were younger, we had kids that they were befriending in high school just before they got to going into college and junior college that, uh, that wanted to come over for our family on either Friday night or Saturday night when we could assemble the family and nothing was going on. And they would come eat with us. I mean, weird kids with piercings and tattoos and dyed hair. And they would come eat with us. They were good kids. They just looked strange. <laughs> and, and they called me and Lena and said, you are the beavers. You got to be old enough to know who, who Cleaver was and the leave it to beavers. But that's what they thought we were like. And one of them was saying that to us one night, because we just did this every week. We'd turn off the television We'd collect the cell phones. They didn't have them back then, but nowadays we'd collect the cell phones, move them away, because you get distracted, and now you've ended the conversation. And we'd turn off the ringer on the telephone. We had landlines then. And we would just sit after the meal. We'd just pile the dishes in the middle of the table. We didn't stop and go wash the dishes. We piled them up or cleared them away and sat around the table and talked and listened. That's how I knew where my kids were at. That's how they could ask questions about why mom and dad do things the way they do. And these kids that would come be part of our family for that Sabbath meal, they could, they could not believe what a family was like. They'd never, they hadn't experienced it. It was just, your food's on the stove, go get it. If there was food cooked on the stove. Many of them hadn't had a meal from home in weeks. One boy, I remember asking him, when was the last time you had a meal with your family? He stopped and thought and thought and thought. And finally he said, I think it's been about three months. Listen, folks, the state can't raise your kids. The school can't raise your kids. If you don't raise them, they won't know God. They won't be people of character. They won't learn responsibility. They won't ever become adults. They'll become the playboy and playmates of the modern culture, never forming a family, never making covenant, never living for God, only living for their own pleasure. You have to raise your kids. Honor God. Keep the covenant. Raise the kids. And you will be pleasing to God Almighty. So Jesus stood up. And he announced this, and you don't know, unless you know the culture, 
This was a slap in the face to the Pharisees. You know why? Because every day for a week, they had watched the Pharisees go to the pool of Siloam and bring water and pour it out at the base of the altar in the temple so the water would run out down the porch. Why? Because of Ezekiel's vision in Ezekiel 47 of the river of life flowing out from the temple. I mean, you've heard the story. You've heard people preach about it. It comes out from the temple. First, it's a trickle. And then you go out, and then it's up to your ankles. And you go a little further, and it's up to your knees. Then you go a little further, it's up to your waist. Then you finally get out to where you've got to swim to get across it. That same picture is in Revelation 22, the end of the age, when God's kingdom prevails and Christ is ruling and the people of God have become joint heirs with Jesus as kings and priests unto God. Out of them, the temple of God, the corporate temple of God, the river of life flows out to touch every nation. And he said, there are trees lining that river that it's so prolific, filled with life that they bear fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I want some of that water, don't you? Jesus said to the woman at the well when he gave her a preview of him being the Messiah, and he, she, he, said, he asked her for water. He set her up to give her a revelation. And all of his big highfalutin apostles that were in training, he'd sent them to the grocery store to go get some grub. But he had something to eat that they didn't have. He was feeding on the will of God. He went into alien, strange, cultural territory to rescue one woman in the village of Samaria. Now, this was a big issue. Because the Samaritans didn't worship at the temple in Jerusalem. They developed their own temple and their own way of worship. They were half-breeds, according to the Jews, because they had intermarried. And now they had phony worship. They didn't measure up. But Jesus went searching for an outcast, for a reject, for a minority, for somebody that was despised. And he went without food or water and sat on the side of a well and waited for a divine appointment to come to him. And she showed up and he engaged in a magnificent revelation of discussion with this untaught woman. And it started with a debate about the water of life. People, I want to tell you, people are thirsty for living water. They're not hungry for religion. In fact, Jesus said to her, the time will come when you won't worship God at a place or in a temple, but you'll worship God in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship Him. The Father goes ahead of us to find people that are hungry in their sin, in their failures, in their disasters. He's looking for people that despite the trauma being painted with a brush of failure and divorce and, and, and being a unclean, he pursues those that are hungry for living water and are willing to worship him in spirit and in truth. And some of the troubles that you've gone through that have been so strange have actually served to unplug you from relying on a religious system as a substitute for reality, the source of eternal life, Jesus himself. The Lord hasn't forgotten where you are. He knows your journey. He understands each step you've been on and the puzzling circumstances that brought you to where you are. He knows the hairs of your head. He knows the days of your life. They're numbered by him. He's got a book with all the details of you already written. And he's waiting to transfer your name into the book of life where you have received Jesus Christ and found real life in him. That's the purpose of life, 
to find him, to know him, and to make him known. And Jesus evangelized that woman and talked to her about living water, the real deal. Not the substitute, just the water in the well. God's after people that are thirsty, that are willing to turn from form and ritual to reality and relationship. So, back to John chapter 7. Jesus stands up on the last day. Now remember, it started out with him not wanting to make himself known. (laughs) Jesus, gentle, meek, and mild. If only he had kept a low profile. But instead, he makes a show. He draws attention to himself. He couldn't take it anymore. He was seeing the priests pour the water out, manufacturing a stream of living water coming out of a house where the presence of God no longer existed. The same temple he had gone into and braided a whip of cords and overturned the money changers and said, you've made this house of prayer and house of worship, you've made it into a den of thieves. You've turned what God intended for all nations to be a blessing into a business, into a merchandising scheme, into a franchise model, which they did with synagogues too, which we do with our denominations. Many of them served their day. They preserved the truth God gave over the historic uh, restoration waves that God has done in the church. But whenever you turn and make the church an idol, you have now transgressed. So Jesus stood up and said, I see all of you going to the temple because you see the water being poured out. And he stood up and made an alternative suggestion. If you're thirsty, come to me. Whoa, the Pharisees got it. The Jews understood it. We look at it and we don't get it. Don't you remember that Jesus had said in John chapter 2, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And it says, it explains it, John explains it, but this he spake of his body. In hindsight, they knew he was talking about the resurrection, his body being raised up. His body being a temple of the presence of God. You see, all of Jewish life revolved around the Sabbath, keeping the laws, the seven great feasts that was on their calendar, and all of those traditions that they kept. And of all of them, what became the greatest thing in their religion? The temple. So when Jesus said that, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. Somebody wrote it down. And later, at his trial, when they mocked him and scourged him, they brought, they hired accusers. It's in Matthew 26. They hired accusers to bring forth false accusations. And some of them said, this man said, you destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rebuild it. They said, that's heresy. That's sacrilege. Even the the other thief on the cross, one of them said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. The other thief, we forget what he said. You said, destroy this temple and in three days you'll raise it up. Come down from the cross and save yourself. That's what the other mocker and thief said. The thing Jesus said about the temple got him killed. They didn't care. They had lots of false prophets and people uh, want to be messiahs out there in those days. They really did. Had a lot of them. But Jesus undermined the temple. And he said, I'm the real source of living water. Now he said to those that believe on him, you're going to become a source. See, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3 and then in 1 Corinthians 6, your body, Ron's body, is a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That's why you, you should not and cannot participate in immorality. Sexual immorality joins your body to somebody else's body. That's a fact of life. That's the way human beings work whenever you're in a marriage. That's perfectly blessed and okay. But until God sanctions that, you keep your body pure for God. This wicked age is full of immorality. Everybody thinks now that promiscuity is the normal pattern of life. It is not. You want me to tell you about the sex life for singles and teenagers in the, in the church of Jesus Christ? You don't have one. You keep yourself pure and celibate until you get married. There is a place in the courtship for romance to grow, but until then, you be careful because your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So, say, oh, preacher, I don't like that. Well, that's tough. That's the way the Bible says, though. It's true. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. God wants the best for you, not some substitute that has been... Um, bought by the pattern of the world, God's way is better. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you've received Jesus Christ, the scripture says in Romans 8, you don't belong to him unless the spirit of Jesus is in you. Now, whenever you get born again, what happens to you? The Holy Spirit comes into your inner man, into your spirit, down in your belly, down in my heart. You know, I like, to educate my mind. God gave me a pretty smart brain, even though it does run rabbit trails. But he's given me a curiosity and a mind that wants to learn, and God doesn't put any premium on ignorance. He wants you to be educated and to know the word and to get filled with sound doctrine. Not crazy stuff, sound doctrine. That's why I like, that's why everything I teach, I'm willing for this man Who's, uh, who's such a wonderful friend, but partner in ministry with his apostolic gift and his teaching gift and his expert training, I'm willing that everything I do be scrutinized. If you've got pet doctrines you don't want anybody to know about, you probably need to bring it into the light. Uh, but Tony, I've been meaning to tell you about my theory about seven raptures. <laughs> you know, that's the weird stuff. Hey, there's enough things out there where there's room for Maybe a private interpretation. But when we're building the church, we want to have solid doctrine that's unshakable. Amen? So I don't want to preach on anything that I don't know that God hasn't opened up to me in the Word. I've never been able to do anything but that. So your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That's good doctrine. We need a good theology about our physical body. Okay? Now, you corporately as members of the body of Christ, are a corporate body. Turn to somebody and say, you're part of the corporate body. Like it or not, you are connected. How many of you came into the world without a father or a mother? Anybody here? You just spontaneously appeared on the scene, maybe under a leaf. How many of you were born of a mother? I was, were you? Natural life comes out of people in relationship. Love produces life. Spiritual life is the same way. We spiritually reproduce when we walk in love with each other, honor one another, welcome the presence of God, let His Word take root in our lives, and we bear fruit. And it's so easy and natural, we, we forget, oh, wait a minute, I was supposed to have a class to teach me how to do that. No, no. You just love people and share Jesus with them. You will bear fruit. You say, I'm learning something from the Bible. Would you like to learn with me? You go do that with them and you will bear fruit. You say to your neighbor, I've been praying for you because uh, it's just been on my heart to do that. Why are you doing that? Well, because I'm a follower of Jesus. Would you like to know him too? My brother Don was telling me yesterday about a, a businessman, a, a very high-end lawyer that his son works with in Houston. Um, hope y'all get to meet my brother one day. He's smarter than I am. I'm, ha I'm more handsome, but he's smarter. <laughs> he's my identical twin brother. 
Um, and I can't use that joke. Lane has told me don't use that joke anymore about one of us being handsome and one of us being rich. So I won't do that. <laughs> but he, he's raised four brilliant sons. And one of them is working for the most powerful law firm in Houston, Texas, and is an ethical man. I mean, ethics and honor and truthfulness. And Don has taught him all that. And Don has taught that you keep your word. You, you are scrupulous. You do never accept a bribe in the business world. But you be a man of your word. And God's prospered him and prospered his sons because of that. Well, John, this son... His mentor at that law firm died suddenly last week. Just died suddenly. John is so heartbroken over it. But that man, Don had met him twice over the last year. And the first time he learned that the man was battling cancer. The second time John met him, he brought up spiritual things with him. And he said to that lawyer that had a mind like a steel trap, that could quote Shakespeare and Yeats and poetry and and plus the law books and one more cases. And Don said to this brilliant man, I know you're struggling with your health. Have you tried God? And the lawyer looked at him and said, yes, I have. I've turned to God and he's, I'm growing stronger and closer to him every day. What a simple way to witness. Have you tried God? Maybe they'll blow up at you and curse you. You won't die from that, will you? No, you just you just realize that was hard ground. They're not they don't want to, they're not thirsty. But you try it with people that are thirsty, and you'll find hungry hearts. You'll find there is a place for what is in you to flow out of you to them. Out of your belly. Now look, I want to tell you something. You're pregnant. Men, put your hand down there on your belly. You're pregnant. There is a seed inside you called the Word of God. And the Spirit of God and the Word of God agree. And they germinate inside you and produce something that looks like Jesus. In its early stages, it may be a baby Jesus. Don't you know Jesus was a baby at one time? And he needed Mary to care for him and nurse him and tenderly love him. Maybe the Jesus in you is like a child Jesus. And you know, don't you know that the carpenter, Mary's husband, took the boy and said, now it's time for me to train you and for you to learn. And you learn some tasks, you fail at other tasks, you grow up, you follow him around, even go with him to the temple. And lo and behold, when he was 12 years old, They lost Jesus at the temple. They left and were headed home, thought he was riding with somebody else, and realized after a couple of days, where's Jesus? Now look, I've sinned and stumbled a few times in my life, but I've never lost Jesus. (laughs) And if they could be rescued and redeemed and forgiven for losing the Son of God, God can cover my sins if I confess them and repent. Amen? Just say to yourself, thank God I never lost Jesus. <laughs> or maybe there is the, the young Jesus as a young adult growing into the realization of his identity and his mission and even of the price he would pay. And then the father brought him out to meet the conditions of the old religious system and be baptized to fulfill all righteousness, not because he had any sins, And then the Holy Spirit fell on him and the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. Three times, at least three times, I know of that the Father spoke audibly from heaven and affirmed Jesus' identity. Look, he was the new temple in which the fullness of God dwelt. We become the temple of God when we assemble together and pray together, and worship together, and grow together. We're becoming an army of God. I remember a year and a half ago, the Lord had a word for this church. 
It was, if you'll slow down and move into the right turn lane, you can take the city. If you don't, you'll blow through the intersection and just become a big church, successful church. Successful churches are a dime a dozen. But leaders, just like that word from Andrea, who want to sit at the table with the next generation and give away what they've got and mentor them and groom them and learn to trust them and hear them coming back eager to be discipled and to be trained and to be equipped for more of Jesus to be manifest through their lives for the kingdom of God to come on the earth. That's rare. Folks, you're not playing in a pastoral pond in this church anymore. We have pastors. We have home group leaders. We have a shepherd's heart. But we don't want to just leave you where you are. You're swimming in an apostolic river. And we're going somewhere. Just like Israel had to go somewhere from Egypt to the promised land. Just like Jesus had to grow up and become a man who could do the will of the Father. Just like the church had to go through um, all of the things that they went through in the book of Acts so that the Holy Spirit could minister through them. So now you are become a living temple filled with life-giving water. And part of it, part of that life flows through you, not because you're so special, but because who you're embedded with. I want to be under that cloud as God leads us. I want to watch the pillar of fire as we follow close behind Moses. I want to see where the Lord has taken us. I don't want to get off the ship or get off the train or, or stop the journey short. I want to see the adventure God has for us. And we're being positioned to receive that fullness. And the Lord wants to include you. The requirement, as we learned here, the annual feasts of September remind us, we're in a September to remember because October we're going to cross over. There is, there is, we were reminded that we're the, 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 the Feast of Trumpets reminds us, when I hear trumpets or see it in the scriptures, I think of what the book of Revelation says and what the, uh, the, 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 the time when God came down on the mountain and Moses went up and the trumpets, and I think of what Paul said in Thessalonians about the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. It makes me think of the return of the Lord and that feast of trumpets that we've already celebrated is a reminder, Jesus is coming back. And if you believe in Jesus and know him, there is no other place you can go but with him. Amen. Don't be afraid. You're saved by faith, not by works. You say, well, I'm imperfect. He's a very good savior. That's what he does for a living. And he is a high priest who ever lives to make intercession just for you. Their sins and their iniquities, God says, I've blotted them out. You're under the blood of Jesus, and that's an eternal blood covenant. It can't be erased. The devil may make you tempted or tired or exhausted or buffeted. All those things have happened to me. But the one thing he cannot do is he cannot go back in history and undo what Jesus did on the cross. It's finished. That forever stands. And so that reminds me that when he comes back, my hope is in him. That's the hope of the church, his soon return. His visible return with the armies of angels. And the dead in Christ will rise. We'll meet him in the air. And we're going to rule and reign with him here on the earth. Oh, the wicked are going to be so surprised. And then the, the day of atonement that we're in right this weekend on the Jewish calendar the reminder of when all was finished, redemption was accomplished. And by the way, I think that also releases judgment for those that refuse that sacrifice, that blood, that reject what Jesus did for them. Judgment is inevitable. If you don't have the blood on the doorposts of your home, the death angel will come for your firstborn. A curse will come on your family. Judgment comes when you're alienated from God and the devil has his way with you. There's only one safe place that's under the covering of Jesus Christ. And in that humble, low place, the meek will inherit the earth. 
He justifies you. He sanctifies you. He will glorify you. And when he comes back, you'll become like him because you'll see him as he is. Oh, all this in heaven too. And then finally, the Feast of Tabernacles that John 7 was talking about. That's, by the way, that feast includes Gentiles. And it has not been kept for Israel for all these 2,000 years. Why? Because God wants the Gentiles to be brought in with the Jews and celebrate that the houses of the Lord fill the land for the glory of God. The water has gone out from the temple and is affecting the nations. There will be so many people brought to the Lord. His kingdom will be so inexorable. Do you know what inexorable means? It means unstoppable, like a big old D9 caterpillar bulldozer. It gets to moving and you just better get out of the way because you can't stop it. <laughs> the kingdom of God is advancing and it will increase until the king comes back. And it will increase so much that Jesus said when that end comes, Matthew 13, I'll have to send my angels to remove the stumbling blocks out of my kingdom. Because the kingdom is so big I can't take the believers out. I'll have to take the wicked out. Whoa. His word is unstoppable. His kingdom is increasing. God the Father wants to see Jesus receive everything he paid for on the cross. He's my victory. Is he yours? Bow your head just for a moment. If you have never surrendered to Jesus Christ, I challenge you to do it right now. You say, I want to get out of this kingdom of darkness. I want to get into the kingdom of God. I want to turn away from sin controlling my life. I want to be right and righteous before God, and clean and pure before God. I want my life to count for Jesus. Is that what you want? These altars are open. You can come up here and kneel and pray. We'll meet you and pray with you. What have you done with Jesus? Now, to those of you that are believers, thank God for that. But if you have resisted being full of the Holy Spirit, I want to challenge you. Get filled up with the Holy Spirit so you can overflow because God wants out of your inner being, out of your heart, out of your inside, out of your spirit man. He wants living water to flow. Everywhere you go, he wants life to touch dead people. He wants life to resurrect dormant seed in the ground. He wants life to water thirsty ground. You carry that life with you. And you as a church, corporately, I challenge you. When you come together, don't come together just to get to church and go to the meeting and get it done with so I can scoot on out. You come with a commitment. I'm going to worship God together with my brothers and sisters. We are, we are embedded together. We are connected together. And we're moving somewhere together. Your personal welfare is also impacted by the experiences and the growth of this corporate body. We're in this together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Would you stand with me? Let me pray a blessing upon you. I want to thank you for paying attention, letting me preach to you today. I love Jesus, don't you? I got alone with the Lord this morning. I'll tell you an odd thing I prayed this morning. I said, got along with God in my quiet place, and I just said, Father, Father me. Father, Father me. He loves us enough to do that for us. Did you know that? Amen. If you're a prodigal and you've backslidden, you want to come back to the Lord. These altars are open. If you want to just seek God, every good progress in your life that will last begins with you seeking God. Okay? Father, I bless these people. I thank you for the, the stewardship and the privilege of being a helper for their faith and for their joy.
And I pray you'd further us all along in our walk with you. Let Christ be glorified by us bearing much fruit for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hug one another's necks as you go.